kind of get things going, to give you some, some things to think about, was to kind of give our top tips for um, dealing with school systems. So uh, we, I brought some things to look at, and, and then we're going to open it up, so fire away. Um, so my first tip is be prepared. And what that means is making sure you have all your records together, as well as um, ensuring that you're not rushed. So what I mean by that is, if you get goals the day of the, the R, or the day before, or you get a, an, a, a, any kind of um, document that you need to, to read through, postpone the R and take your time and don't be rushed because these are important decisions for your children. So I, you know, that's part of being prepared is knowing what you're getting back from the school so that you can make informed decisions. So. Okay, one of my top tips, and it's actually in um, From Emotions to Advocacy by Mr. Wright. Our Bible. Yes. By he is a, <laughs> he's one of the top, probably the top special education attorney in the country, and he's a dyslexic um, himself, and he has ADHD as well. And he recommends that when you go into a meeting, although you know that you are the expert on your child, and as a parent, no one, I don't dispute that at all. The problem is, is that school teams view themselves as experts as well. So if you go in there and you say, I'm telling you this, they will take offense and they'll feel like, whoa. They'll get defensive and they'll be, this parent is a real know-it-all. And how do we, you know, how do we group and contain this individual that is the parent of this child? So what we recommend, and Peter Wright recommends, is you go in there and you ask lots of questions because it makes them feel empowered as well. And when you ask questions, sometimes they say, I don't know the answer to that and I need to find out. So, you know, you ask the who, what, why, how questions and where, those questions, but you also go in there and you get that dialogue going by asking open-ended questions and that will make for a more collaborative meeting and it might actually disarm difficult people and you know we often go into odd meetings and there's someone in there who is in charge of it and you can tell that they're the person who's dominating the decision making and when you get that collaboration going people start to let their guard down so and you might get more success in advocating for your child and making changes to your plan, and getting additional services. So that's my top tip for our meetings. I call it like, the, do y'all watch Law and Order? Do y'all watch it? Okay. So usually you're ask, they're asking questions where you already know the answer, in a way. So it's kind of the leading questions. That's what you're trying to do, is to get them to tell you, which kind of, you kind of know, but you're not necessarily going, I know this. You're, drawing it out of them. So my other top tip, um, and some parents are nervous about this, is to record your meetings. And a lot of parents say, oh, I don't want to look adversarial. Here's my, my tip on that. I have a horrible memory. <laughs> I can't remember all that's being said to me. So I want to be able to record it so that when I get the document back that I haven't signed yet because I want to re review it, uh, I'm able to listen to the recording and make sure that everything is in the document that we talked about. So then I sign it because none of us, I mean, you wouldn't buy a car and not read the fine print, nor should you do that for your child's education. So that is one thing I, I recommend. And if, if uh, they will look at you probably a little cross-eyed at first, then they'll remember when you come in the next time. Uh, they'll scramble because they want to record as well, which is fine. But the point being, you just, you know, to, to not be that mom, because I get a lot of that, is just say, you know what, this is going to help me remember what we're saying. So. Okay, so I've got another tip, which is this is commonly handed out at the beginning of the school year, and it's called the Notice of Procedural Safeguards. And this document is actually your rights as a parent, and it has all of the, um, if you're in dispute, if 
you want a second opinion on an evaluation, it's all in here. And usually I joke in the yard and I say, oh yeah, this is great if you have insomnia and you're having trouble getting to sleep at night because it's full of legalese. But this is invaluable because I've had clients come to me and say, I didn't know you could get a second opinion on an evaluation that the school pays for. And I said, it's in your, it's in this. And so this is a really valuable document and, and schools never explain it. They never go through it. They never, they never point, they never say, oh, look, you really need to read this section. Very important, Mrs. or Mr. Parent. And so this is just sort of thrown across the table. And yet it's full of so much useful information that will guide you in getting an appropriate program. So I always recommend to read this. <laughs> and I, just on that topic, yeah. I have found, my husband's an educator, and he's one that convinced me to get back into doing this. Um, they are not um, free to say that. Oh, by the way, look on page mm -hmm. four. They would get in trouble. So it's really going to be up to you to, to read this stuff. Yeah. So since you talk about reading, <laughs> These are kind of my three favorite books. So, as we alluded to either before, this is called From Emotions to Advocacy. It is, I, I would say it's probably the best book for parents and advocates. It explains things very plainly. Um, it explains the why. It does explain some of the law that goes along with what's in here. It talks about preparation, goals, all sorts of things. So, if there's one book you're going to get this is the one we we do not get paid by right just you know but it is what we all use okay I'm sure y'all have gone through a bazillion evaluations I like to use this one because what it does is it very plainly explains to me what all those tests are and why they're being done and how they're measured because um, sometimes even when you go into a meeting with your um, the person who's the, the diagnostician they're kind of running through stuff, and it's very hard to kind of understand. But this is actually great. It, it's really, really plainly written, and I love this book. This is another insomnia book. <laughs> if you really, really, really want to understand all the stuff, case law stuff like this, this is a skinny down version. But um, to give you an idea, there's no pictures of them. <laughs> so <laughs> it's very, very boring. Again, another book that is an insomnia book. Uh, you won't need to take any kind of um, sleeping aids after reading this. So, yeah, so those are kind of um, our, our time. you get any more? Um, I like to record too. One of the things with recording is you can say, you can kind of disarm them again and say, I'm a terrible note taker, so I'm going to record the meeting. And usually they're okay, aren't they? Oh, so, yeah. I mean, and, but, yeah. yeah. It's usually that first time because they aren't expecting you to say that. And, and they're scrambling because if you record, they yeah. like to record as well. I think that happened with us. Yes, All of a sudden, they're, who has to record? Yeah, <laughs> so then you yeah. just kind of wait. Yeah. Um, there's just one other thing. If you get into an ARD and, uh, or a 504 meeting, whatever it is, and you need time to think about what's being said, couple things you can do or they've provided you with something you've never seen before and did not have time to read stop the art ask for recess you do two things one you can say I need to step out for a little bit that's a short recess or you can basically say I would like to continue this meeting at another time um, part of that as well this is another part of that is that, and, they'll, and then they'll just say, well, we were scheduled, and usually they'll set a new, new date. But, but the other part of this is they've rushed you. They are under a compliance deadline, and maybe they've rushed you and said, you know, Here, here's all these documents, we're meeting tomorrow. If you were to call and say, I really need more time to, to prepare and to read through this, um, they may say, oh, well, you know, we're under our deadline. I say, okay. I'll get on the phone, we'll have a five minute art. And what that does is it'll, it, it is you being cooperative in saying, okay, I'll help you make your deadline, but then you're going to give me time. So you can actually do a five minute art, 
say, you know what, um, we're coming in here um, because, you know, we're to make your deadline, but we're going to have a continuance or a uh, you know, basically a continuance of the yard. We're going to recess the yard until we have more time to So, yeah, please, please, please don't feel rushed ever. That's my biggest tip. Yeah, don't they, they, they seem to try to run the clock out at the end of the year and make you go right up to the, the last and couple we, days. And we now. did that. We but did that. that it seems to be their standard operating procedure so that a lot of people just give up and mm -hmm. they sign. And so to, to that extent, um, I always say, you know, and we've, we've done this before, if you sign, and let's just say you, you, you signed it in that kind of a state, you can always immediately call, right? You can immediately send a letter and say, I rescind. I rescind my signature. I want to move the art. Um, the end of school arts are kind of funky. Mm -hmm. I tend to like to have, and we've talked about this, the beginning of the year arts, which you're in the thick of them now. Yes. I've stepped back a little bit. And um, because people leave, as, as you guys know, there's new people, yeah. there's new players, people don't remember. So it's always good, even if you have the end of your art, to follow back and, and redo that. And by the way, you can you can ask for an art any time, any time. You could have, I had a parents, we had them every month. Yes, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So, not that you want to be in the school all the time, but my point is, you can call them. It's your right as for parent participation. Yes, and I've heard that too, that some parents will say, well, I, you know, we only get an annual odd, and, and I'm like, no, you know, the, the great thing about IEPs is they're a dynamic document. Children are growing, mm -hmm. and as they change and things happen, and maybe you get new information from an outside provider, mm -hmm. those are all things that need to be shared with the school so it can inform mm -hmm. the IEP, and so, you know, I tell parents, if you have something that is going to change the services or the goals or the mm -hmm. present levels, mm -hmm. the school needs to know about it because they need to hold an odd meeting. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. you know, but those are the things that we hear that this is all on a schedule and it's very rigid and you're stuck. I've even heard you're stuck with this IEP for a year and I said that is absolutely not correct. Mm -hmm. You get to, you get to change it mm -hmm. and, um, review is continual if it has to be. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and a lot of times we see a lot of change in kids over the summer, mm -hmm. especially those kids who are in middle school through, you know, first years in high school. There's a lot of things going on, so it, it's really important to then have another checkpoint with the school um, at the beginning of the year. So usually I don't sweat that last, like the very last one, because I know we're coming right back. It, you have to. Um, because, like I said, things change. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question. Yeah. It's like kids that are not old enough to go to school yet, but they, I think they get services. Mm -hmm. So she's in that, um, you know, looking into that. How old is he now? Three. Three. Okay. He's, so he's eligible for PPC. Okay. There's oh. no, yeah, I'm not ready. There's not really a whole lot of good school districts where we're from. Mm -hmm. Like, it's really good in special education. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to all that vibe because that's, I remember my first yeah. PPCDR, <laughs> yeah. like it was yesterday and she's 26, so, um, you know, take it slow, take it slow, be, you know, do what's comfortable. I used PPCD as a supplement to private services and more for socialization and just Think about it as you're trying to get your child just to get used to being in that environment, and then everything else is kind of secondary. That try to support that. Um, I tell soul parents have a long game and have a vision, um, and that's hard when you're when you have a little kid. It's really hard. I get it. It's like and and especially when you're still going through the trauma and the. I, I, I'm right there with you. I found out only a couple weeks before I had my daughter. So I remember, and I remember that day, like a long time. See, I get a little, a little emotional about that. So, um, 
it's it's really important to be in groups like this. So you're seeing adults with with TBI, and you're seeing how they're living because that's going to be your north star. Okay. So through their entire school career, that's what you're thinking about. What am I going to do to get him in that the path? Those little steps to get them to adulthood. And what do I see for them? Because there are very bright futures, even if you can't see it right now, right? It's really hard to see it um, because you're going to therapy all the time, right? <laughs> you're going to doctor's appointments, but always have that in your mind as you're preparing your child from PPCD all the way through, okay? That's what you're going for. Uh, Jared, would you like to say something about how your accommodations throughout after your injury? Um, I don't know how helpful I can be. Uh, when I had my injury, I was already uh, in college at UT, and I already had accommodations. So they pretty much just added on to those mm -hmm. um, without any issue that I remember. Um, but UT is definitely very helpful in that whole process. Um, they allowed me to do everything as a full-time student, even though it's part-time. And uh, the professors were all really accommodating. So that was, that was really helpful. Uh, the was really helpful. Um, as far as high school, I got accommodations for anxiety. But that was, I went to private school, so it's a whole different process. I remember I just had to get a test. And yeah. Yeah. So it's probably a little different, but that's my experience. Yeah. And I think, you know, to that point, ask for help because the answers aren't all in here. I mean, your, your heart is in it. But having, like I said, I love that there's groups like this. My, I, well, actually, we're all Chicagoans. <laughs> well, she's a Brit by Chicago. Yeah. We'll give it to her. <laughs> there was a huge community for kids with spinal good job. And I would like so heavily on those moms to get me through those first years. And then my daughter got into adaptive sports, and oh my gosh, our life completely opened up. And it was, those are my peeps, that's my tribe, and they still are, because um, they understand. So um, hang in there, baby steps. Don't do anything that you don't think, any, go with your gut, okay? And, um, you know, just keep, getting to know people, keep asking questions. So I would add to that, just, you know, I know physicians come and go, but sometimes you have that constant physician advocate for your child, and if you can form a relationship with all of your child's doctors, mm -hmm. those people are invaluable, and in fact, they can help inform whatever happens in the school system, yeah. even though they're medical, and I'll give you an example, well this isn't related to um, TBI, but my daughter was experiencing severe anxiety and her psychiatrist, who of course is a medical doctor, wrote a letter to the school and said, you know, if you don't give her supports and give her an evaluation for this anxiety, it could be catastrophic. I mean, she wrote this very powerful letter that they had to take notice of and in fact under the law it was a trigger for them to do another evaluation. So if you can develop relationships with your children's doctors, those people will always be there for you to bounce off. And I encourage parents to bring in all of that outside information and even get the physicians on the phone in the ARD meeting because they're the, they really are the experts on uh, you know, neurology and that, that type of Thing, uh, not the schools, they don't have that expertise. So I'd encourage you to do that. And I have found when we get a doctor on the phone or an OT or a PT, a private, um, we've done this for also for speech. Mm -hmm. uh, when we have a kiddo who is maybe on a, on a G2 or um, that kind of thing, that we can um, uh, bring, even if it's 15 minutes on the phone, you would be amazed at the uh, even the change in the faces and demeanor <laughs> um, of your educators, because it's one thing for us to say it, even for parents <coughs> sometimes, but if you have that relationship where you can think, you know, 
know what, doctor, can you spend just 10 minutes explaining why we're asking for what we're asking for? And also, obviously, have it in writing, too. Um, it can make a world of difference. It really could. Um, so build, build, build the relationships now. You know, with your pediatricians, um, neuropsychs, anybody that you're, you're dealing with. Yeah. yeah. Quick question, ladies. For example, schools, they have their own district PTs or district OTs, and they usually go with what they recommend, mm -hmm. not so much from outside uh, mm -hmm. resources. How do you go about that? I bring the beat the private in. Do you have to the table? Mm -hmm. oh, I've gone to many oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and as they soon as the kids start school, I ask yeah. to exchange the numbers yeah. because the, the therapist yes. in the school and a private, because the private spends a lot more time, mm -hmm. they, the miscommunication, the equipment gets ordered there, and then what, I can't order it, or and somebody else orders it, and it's not fitted for the kids. So as soon as the kids start school, I'm like, give them my phone number, mm -hmm. and we go to all the R's. Yeah, I've brought yeah. in um, OTPT speech, um, vision. Of, uh, we've had people in to explain PEC systems. I mean, anything. If, if you have an outside provider, and you can bring them to the table, Please do, and yeah, get them talking to each other. Um, that is so critical because it's true. We'll have, I have, the school was doing a PEX that was totally different than the speech therapist. Do you know what PECs are? I'm talking kind of in, oh, sorry. PECs are for kids who are nonverbal. They can be all sorts of different things. It could just be something like pictures, or it could be much more. Um, uh, much more robust than that. It could be on their computer, eye gaze, all sorts of stuff. But the point being, if your private speech therapist is teaching them how to communicate it with one method, and they go to school and it's completely different, you're going to have a child who's going to get really frustrated. And then, I always say behavior is communication. Okay. So, whoops. <laughs> I'll just put it over there. So, behavior is communication. And if you can remember that, question is what are they trying to communicate that's the tricky part okay mm -hmm. so when you have something like that where you have that difference going on they're confused you know they're spending all their time with you and then they go to school and it's not quite the same and they might be getting a totally different set of directions so yes absolutely get them together and I just want to add Lakeway will try to have that conversation outside the art don't let them it's really important that teachers get to hear what the outside people are saying also. This is the district we are in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll do that. That's what they did with me. They had it separate, and then in our R, they acted like it didn't even happen. So, so what I do to that is, yes, I, in the R, ensure that there is some conversation, but then I also schedule a meetup, and then they have to report back what the meetup was in writing. So that if they have a meeting, okay, you know, but you're going to give me the list of what you did and you're gonna report right. that in the next draft. Right, because they didn't do that, so I took in my own notes and they acted like eh. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Always have yeah. it, put it on those guys to then come back and say, you know, we talked, this is what we agreed upon. A good PT or OT in the school, these, first of all, they're trying to do the best they can with what they have. Okay. They're underfunded, undertrained, um, underappreciated, right? <laughs> so they're trying to do the best with what they have. And they've got, you know, administration and they have, you know, they, they answer to a lot of people. So they're trying to do the best they can. Um, well, they do an impossible job. I mean, Lake Travis ISD is a huge district. Yeah. And they have one PT. I know. PT. Yeah, they're about growing. To, I think they said 800 new kids this year. Yeah. About to hire the number one. Right. right. So, so you know, crazy. these guys, they, they want to do what's right, but yeah. they can't. So what you're doing is you're kind of giving them the tools, mm -hmm. but you're not just giving to them willy-nilly, to your point. Then there's also follow-through. Right. So I'm going to give you the tool, but you're going to show me how you're using it. Does right, because they, they definitely rely on the, um, mm -hmm. if it's not on paper, it didn't happen. Yeah. 
So make sure you get it on paper. The other there. thing I always do is PTOT speech goals, any kind of therapy goals, I do, we send them to the private um, and have them, if it's an ABA therapy, whatever it is, um, we will send it to the private to have them weigh in on. So, you know, if a PT can't be at a meeting, at least I have what the PT's response is um, ahead of the meeting, by the way. This is where I say, make sure you're getting stuff ahead of time because these are the little things you have to go do to make sure that you're coming up with something that's going to be, you know, workable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And reach out to them well ahead of time because mm -hmm. Lake Travis, they like to give it to you the night before. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Didn't, I, I, and, and that's where I, we go, okay, we'll give you a five minute hour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now we reconvene. There's actually, uh, we, I didn't bring it, but there's a book by a Connecticut attorney called Jennifer Laviano, and she's written you spell that? <laughs> Laviano, L-A-V-I-A-N-O, and she wrote a book called Your Special Education Rights, and, and she used to have, they used to do little videos on Facebook, but she wrote a book, and she put in there um, some letters that are about ARD meetings, about IEP meetings, and she said that, you know, here's how to deal with the difficult school personnel that keep scheduling these meetings the next day. And she said, what you do is you send this letter in that's in her book, and it says, you know, you have to, th these meetings have to be scheduled when it's mutually convenient, and, you know, and, and so I sent, I have these, and I sent them to clients, and I'm like, look, they need to give you the three or four dates, mm -hmm. you know, you're working people, but I mean, most parents or are busy. Or doctors. They're, they're, yeah, they're busy with other things, so, um, so it's not reasonable to expect a parent to show up the next day. And so here's a letter you can send in so it doesn't happen again, because it needs to be nipped in the bud. I mean, when they send you an art, an art meeting notice, mm -hmm. They're supposed to send it five days ahead of time, mm -hmm. five school days, and so there has to be sort of some mutual respect mm -hmm. for the preparation. As exactly. as Michelle says, you got to you shouldn't be in a position where you're constantly telling them you haven't given me enough time. Right. I didn't read it. You know, right. that's very yeah. true. Uh, I think once you do it. I, what I have found is once you have to have one of those five minute art, it doesn't happen again because they don't want to have to get everybody in a room. You know, you're talking yeah. about they're getting ten people together. That poor that that case manager is running around the building trying to get everybody in the room and you come in and say, Well, you guys didn't give me enough time. You know, I we're gonna have to reschedule and they all groan. Uh, and that, that case manager is, you know, not happy. So it usually doesn't happen again. But this, this is another, to that point, everything in writing, everything, even the hallway conversation, and this is how you do it in a very nice way. Again, I can't remember everything I'm told. I've got a lot of things going on. But if I have a conversation with a teacher, I always send an email. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I just want to make sure I got everything summarized. So. Um, this is what I think we, we said, and these are the things that maybe we agreed on or whatever, okay? And, and then just saying, you know, if I miss something, please let me know. That's it. And now you've got that whole stack, and if, by the way, if they don't respond, it is what it is. You know, you've got it in writing, and that's really important. I have a question for this. So I've noticed the, the trend with Austin is they'll send you something and they'll, they'll give you two times and then they'll say if you can't make them you're welcome to join in on phone phone conference mm -hmm. so how do you turn around and say uh-uh well you would use that you do something like that letter which is you need to accommodate me and you're supposed to go to some level of effort to do that mm -hmm. and i would say and i'd say two times is not any kind of effort mm -hmm. now they can hold our meetings by conference if, if you want. I've never actually known a parent that's done one by conference. Um, we, like, so we've only had to do it where we've called it and then rescheduled it. Yeah. Um, and so the reason
reason why they're giving you those deadlines is because they're under deadlines. They have so many days they have to do things, right? So they're, this is what's happening in the, in the school. The case manager's running around because they have all these dates of all these kids that they have to do, and they have to get all these teachers together. So they're going to get this date, and then you come back and go, that doesn't work. So now they run around and do it again. So what they're trying to do is short circuit their time. And I can appreciate that as being on the other side and watching my husband having gone through it and him coming home exhausted. So I, I get that. Then, then basically what it is is you can have an art, but you're not going to disagree. Or you're not going to agree to anything because it's not, you're not getting a chance to participate, which parent participation, by the way, is a cornerstone mm -hmm. of the IEP process. So, okay, we're going to have this because you're trying to meet your deadline. We're going to reconvene. And that's it. I'm not going to sign anything. We're going to reconvene. What about if you're going through the meeting and you're noticing they don't have this document that you're referring to, they haven't read this one, they haven't read that one, but they keep telling you, let's just keep going though and we'll Stop. get back to it. Stop. Stop there. You know, it, this is, you know, it looks like we're just not all prepared. So why don't we take a break and give everybody a chance to get on the same page and then we'll come back. I used to think, well, okay, because I guess if we get some of the stuff done, it'll help the kiddos. But now, in hindsight, no, it would have just been better to make it take longer because bad help is worse than no help. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, you, you just, how long was this time you were just in? Two hours. Okay. Two yeah. hours we, is a short one like for me. We had like a six hour one. Well, it's yeah. not done oh, yet. <laughs> She was autism, which has a lot of bells and whistles, and there were four IEEs. Oh, Lord. And we yeah. didn't even, we got through three of them. You know what an IEE is? No. Indi independent. Independent. Oh. Oh. Educational evaluation. I need to talk to you about okay. that later then. So, yes, that's the I other thing. I just thought this. you had them. This is, is the other thing. Years? Since this we brought it up, no, and I can call us on time. time. No. Okay. I'll give you a little more time. Okay. Um, I, I know we don't want to spend the whole night doing this. I know. But <laughs> IEEs. Um, so many surprises. You have an evaluation done on your child and you don't agree with what they're saying. Mm -hmm. You have the right to call for an independent evaluation. Mm -hmm. It is in your procedural safeguards. It tells you how to do it. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you don't have to choose who they want. They're going to give right. you a list, which is very convenient. You're going to choose who you want. Ask your friends, ask your support groups, because you guys know, right? I know where to get the best neuropsychs for my kids, so I tell everybody else, right? Um, get that individual evaluation. They're going to say, oh, but we need to get goals and get things going. I would rather take the time to get the right, the right information that's going to, to get my child. Okay, so we wait 45 days. I know it, and it's like for us, but in the long run, we're going to get a better result. Yeah, I mean, some of the things we see are where the foundational piece, the present levels and the evaluation is, is, it, is lacking. Like there's a speech piece that's missing or there's an AT, OT piece is missing. And so then when the IEP's put together, that's where parents come to us, because they're like, there's something really wrong here. And what's wrong is the foundation is wrong, and so the goals were not written off of the real, all of the deficit areas. And so if you don't hit all of those areas, the school starts playing whack-a-mole. So some of the things that we see are children who can't speak, who are nonverbal, but have the ability to speak, are not taught to speak, so they develop behavior problems. And then the school says, we need to look at the behavior, but hey, wait a minute, they're behaving this way because they can't communicate with you. There's a missing skill. Yeah, and yeah. so this is what we see typically, and we tell them, and we go in and we try to get the schools to see that you have to address all of these areas, because if you don't, you're gonna be playing whack-a-mole with, with the planning and, you know, the, the um, the progress is just not going to be there. In areas are determined by evaluations. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So evaluations are the, the bedrock. And so if those are not correct or incomplete, you're not
not going to have correct and complete IEPs. The other thing about this, present levels, we're not really playing off each other like this. Yeah. Yeah. This was totally <laughs> ad hoc. This wasn't planned. We didn't rehearse. No, no not at all. Um, but it's good. We're, we're you know, validating each other that we're not crazy people. But um, present levels are not your child's uh, uh, joy to have in class. That's wonderful. I'm glad you like my child. What are they doing? Okay. So again, evaluations tell you where the areas are for improvement. Everything should have a number, not a percentage, unless it's like a percentage score of like a test of at least so many questions. Everything should have a, no a firm number. The one thing I tell parents, because it's hard to remember this, the who, what, where, when, how, why is vitally important in writing goals. But the other part of it is remembering this. What does that, what is that gonna look like in the classroom? Can you describe to me what that's going to look like? How are you going to do that? Who's gonna do that? When are you going to do that? And get them to talk to you about that because sometimes they write, they pull from a basically a bank of things and they try to kind of fill in the blanks, but it's not always the right fit. And I have found that if you go through that exercise of asking, and again, this is why we want the goals ahead of time, so we can write these things down. But what you're trying to do is understand what is success going to look like, and how is this going to work with my child, and who's going to do it, and what supports are they going to need, which drives the accommodations, which drives the services. So evaluations drive the goals and the services and the accommodations always. So if you want, real quick, if you want PT services and you haven't had an evaluation that says your child needs it, you can say it all you want, they're not gonna give it to you until you jump through the hoops to then say they need it. So just keep that in mind. Or you want an aid, you have to substantiate it. Anything else? Anyone? I think, <laughs> okay. I think what else? Yeah.